You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. Listen, Jesus calls us all to be fishers of men. A lot of times we're more content to be keepers of the aquarium because it's so much easier to just be part of a church and live in this kind of Christian bubble. We go to church, we watch Christian movies, we hang out with Christian friends, we drive Christian cars, we have Christian pets, I guess, you know. We name them after Bible characters and stuff. Obviously, I'm joking, but the truth is we find ourselves sometimes content just to keep things as they are instead of stepping out of our comfort zone. It's so easy to just live the Christian lifestyle and pretend, so to speak, to be good and faithful Christians. Lots of people live the right life, but don't actually have a deep and meaningful relationship with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In today's message, Pastor Ron will remind you that you are called to be fishers of men, meaning you are to make disciples who make disciples. We can all do the right things, but if our heart, our soul, our strength isn't in the right place, then we're wasting our time. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 16 as he begins his message, God's Plan for the Lost. All right, how you doing? Great, I can hardly wait to get into God's Word. So turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. And uh, we're continuing the journey here. If you haven't been with us, that's what we do. We're learning a lot of great stuff here in Acts chapter 8, and we come really to a new section as a new chapter. So again, we've entitled our study through the book of Acts, Momentum, because we're, we're looking at the momentum that the early church began as they were birthed in Acts chapter 2, and this incredible movement that God began to do and continues to do today through his bride, his church. And uh, today we begin a new chapter, and in doing so, we actually begin a, to see a new work as now the church, for the very first time, begins to move outside of Jerusalem. Up to this point, all the believers and the entire church is huddled in Jerusalem, but now it's going to be moving outward. Of course, that's God's desire is to always take his word out and to reach many. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, the true story of the Titanic uh, you haven't read about it or studied it, you probably even at least saw the movie. But more than 1,500 people of the 2,200 passengers on board sank on April 15th, 1912. The greatest tragedy of all is the fact that those people, none of those people that died had to, though the ship had uh, sunk. Uh, a lot of people, as the the of course, the ship had been struck by an iceberg, and uh, the people then began to clamor on the 20 lifeboats that were on board. Um, unfortunately, those lifeboats were only half full. And so everybody else, of course, had grabbed life jackets, and they had jumped into the waters. But here's the thing. None of those people that died died from drowning. They died of exposure. They froze to death. And the people that were in the lifeboats heard the cries. They heard the dying people crying out for help. And they chose not to go back to rescue them in fear that they might be overcome by the amount of people and they too drown or be capsized. And so one, only one of the lifeboats went back to rescue some of the people. But by the time they got there, it was too late. Of the hundreds of people that were in the water, actually six people were rescued. But again, think about this. This is the tragedy of everything. Those who died, those who died didn't need to because those who were saved in the boats didn't want to go back and save those that were dying. Now listen, that can happen in the church today, and it does happen. Those who are saved are not going to those that are dying, and they die without Jesus, and it happens. Listen, Jesus calls us all to be fishers of men. A lot of times, we're more content to be keepers of the aquarium because it's so much easier to just be part of a church and live in this kind of Christian bubble. We go to church, we watch Christian movies, we hang out with Christian friends, we drive Christian cars, we have Christian pets, I guess, you know. We name them after Bible characters and stuff. Obviously, I'm joking, but the truth is we find ourselves sometimes content just to keep things as they are instead of stepping out of our comfort zone. So my prayer today is that we would all be challenged, myself included for sure, to step out of whatever our comfort zone might be 
and share the love of Jesus. That's what we find in this passage today. We're gonna look at a man by the name of Philip and he takes the gospel to a group of people that everyone thought was unreachable. Actually, the Jews thought they were unredeemable. Why even go to them? But Philip does, and in the process, many are saved. In fact, there's a revival that breaks out. So I've entitled our message today, God's Plan for the Lost. God is gonna use Philip. God wants to use every single one of us. It's not just for the pastor. It's not for the person that has the gift of evangelism. God wants to use all of us to reach the lost. So we're gonna be looking at verses one through 25, and we're gonna divide our time looking at four main thoughts here. And first, we're gonna see Stephen's death. And because, again, we've been looking at that, we're just closing that off here in the beginning of this chapter. Then we see the baton is tossed to Philip. We see his declaration as he takes the gospel out. In the process, though, we meet a man by the name of Simon and his deception. And then we're gonna see Peter's discernment as the apostles come to see what's going on. So let's begin with then Stephen's death. And we find this in the first four verses. It says, now Saul was consenting to his death. Now again, we just spent two whole chapters looking at the life of Stephen. And wow, what a life. Stephen was a spiritual dynamo. It tells us that Stephen was a man full of faith. He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of grace. And he was full of power. That's that's a spiritual dynamo. And because he was such a spiritual dynamo, taking the gospel to people in that area in Jerusalem, the religious leaders couldn't take it. We got to get rid of this guy. And so they came up with trumped up charges, false accusations, and they stoned him to death. Now we saw at the end of chapter seven, as they were stoning him to death, that they laid their cloaks, their outer garments, at the feet of a man by the name of Saul. We're gonna meet him when we get to chapter nine. He becomes the apostle Paul, who becomes the church's greatest missionary and wrote half of the New Testament. But the very fact that they laid their clothes at his feet gives us reason to believe that he was one of the ringleaders. And as we come to the chapter, we see indeed that was true. It says Saul was consenting to his death. Now we also read this though, at that time a great persecution arose, not only against Stephen, but now against the church that was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So Satan now rears his ugly head. Satan, remember, had the disciples arrested several times, brought before the Sanhedrin, stopped preaching the gospel. They continue to do it. Stephen, a perfect example of that. They can't take it anymore. They stone him to death. But now here they are, and now they're just a great persecution. Let's Let's just wipe them all out. Now, obviously, this is a strategy of Satan. He wants to wipe the church out. But listen, what what the enemy means for evil, God will use for good. Now, in fact, God uses this as part of his plan. What do you mean? Well, if you remember all the way back to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the very beginning of this book, and we said this is the outline for the entire book, God tells the disciples, once you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's what we see in the book of Acts. We're watching it go from Jerusalem and now today to Samaria. Then it'll go to Judea and it'll go to the ends of the earth. So right now at this time, the church is about 30,000 members strong and they're all huddled in Jerusalem. They have no intent of leaving, but God is now going to use Stephen's death as a catalyst to bring about persecution that's gonna force the believers out into the world. And so again, what Satan means for evil, God means for good. God always uses and plans his sovereign purposes, even through the frailties of men. God did it in the life of Joseph, you remember that? He was sold by his brothers into slavery. Great brothers, right? Then he's lied about by Potiphar's wife saying, you know, This Joseph tried to rape me. It was a lie. He's thrown in prison. But in God's perfect timing, he's lifted up to second in command in Egypt. And then his brothers come in front of him. And Joseph reveals himself. He goes, and they're thinking, oh, man, we're dead. And he says, no, no, no. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And here I am now able to provide for you. So God will use all things for his glory. And he's even going to use this incredible persecution to use and spread the church outward. 
It was Tertullian, one of the early church fathers who said this, the blood of the martyrs has become the seed of the church. That's a powerful statement. The blood of the martyrs becomes the seed of the church. And that is true. And we see this played over and over and over again in the history of the church. When you begin to persecute the church, the church grows stronger. She is always stronger when she is persecuted. You know what the deadliest enemy against the church is? It's apathy. It's apathy. Perfect example would be Great Britain. Great Britain, we only go back as, you know, as far back as the 1800s. Great Britain is the missionary sending nation of the world, sending the gospel to every continent. And great works had begun and still continue as a result of that. And many great churches birthed in that period. And now you look at some of those churches today over in England and about the UK and their museums. They're dead. And the same thing is happening in the United States because for a long time we've had no opposition. Oh, but guess what? Get ready. Persecution's coming. And when persecution, here's what's gonna happen in persecution, my friends. And I'll tell you, we already saw this shaking during COVID. Those who are not believers, those who are not, don't really wanna walk with the Lord, they're not, they're not gonna come to church. They're not gonna be there. They're gonna fall away. And when the persecutor and the heat gets turned up, those who are just kind of following for the perks or whatever, they're going to fall away. And the true church is going to shine and it purifies the church and it makes the church stronger. Now, I'm not excited about that in one sense, but in one sense, I am, right? So the Lord uses persecution to stoke the fires of revival. That's exactly what we have in this passage. So now the church is going to be scattered abroad. Now it says, except for the apostles at the end of verse one, they would remain here. This would be the, you know, the base or headquarters of the early church. But now again, Stephen has been stoned for his faith and notice verse two, continuing, devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Of course they did. What a great man of God he was. And yet what's so interesting is his life was so brief, right? Right? The the early church is only months old. And Stephen's made such a a stamp on the church. His impact was great. God using it even as a catalyst to take the gospel abroad. I remember the words of Robert Murray McShane, one of the greatest preachers in Scottish history, though he only lived to be 29. He said this, live as so to be missed. He lived that way. Stephen lived that way. We want to live that way. Now, verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. That word havoc means to cause injury, to devastate, to ravage. In fact, this word in the original language in in secular Greek is used to speak of an animal that is out of control, raging, just tearing everything in its path. That's what Saul did. He entered every house, it says, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. We know that, by the way, the Apostle Paul shares his testimony throughout the book of Acts many times. And we get more details as he does so. And we're told in one of the other places that he had received letters from the high priest to do so. So the Sanhedrin gave him legal papers to actually do this. Beyond that, in Acts 22 and verse 4, As he's sharing his testimony there, he says, not only did I arrest people, but I arrested them having charge to put them to death. So imagine being a a Christian, part of the early church, and your your house, your front door is knocked down in the middle of the night, and they drag you and your wife and your children to prison, and then shortly after that, remove your head or some other things as Caesar Nero did dip you in pitch and light you on fire alive. So Saul Saul is a pawn of Satan at this time. He's sadistically ravaging the church. But again, God's going to use this for his glory. It tells us, verse 4, therefore those who were scattered. So the church is scattered. That's an interesting word. The the Greek term, and we use it actually to speak of of this period. We call it the diaspora. That's what the word is, scattered, diaspora. It's used to describe a bunch of seeds that are on a fruit tree or a plant that, you know, you know, burst and the seeds just are scattered. 
kind of like a dandelion or other plants that just diaspora. They are, these spores are put out. That's what this is. The church was scattered and like seeds, and the seeds are the believers, right? The believers are scattered, and it notice it says they are scattered everywhere. Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, right? And what did they do everywhere they went? And they went everywhere preaching the word. Isn't that great? They told people about Jesus. That's what you do wherever you go. They were scattered abroad, but being scattered abroad, they'd end up somewhere else. Maybe they're planted in Samaria. Maybe they're planted in Judea or further beyond. And they're there and say, why are you doing? We fled our country. We're being persecuted. Why? For our faith. In who? In Jesus Christ. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Let me tell you what I've come to know. So everywhere they went, they talked about Jesus. They didn't deny their faith. If they wanted to deny their faith, they could have done that in Jerusalem and lived an easy life. But they said, no, we don't want this easy life. We want, we're willing to die for Jesus. He died for us. We're willing to die for him. But here we see the death of Stephen. God uses his death as a catalyst of persecution to send the gospel out of Jerusalem. Now, moving on, we read about one of the men that went out, and his name is Philip. We see his declaration in verses five through eight. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So here they are, people are being scattered and Philip goes to Samaria. And of course, he does what we're told they all did. He shares the gospel. Now, in doing so, Philip becomes, at least that we understand, he's the first one that's given the notoriety of this. There are others that did it, but we would call him the first missionary, the church's first missionary. So whereas Stephen is the church's first martyr, Philip is the church's first missionary. Now, how did he get to do this? Now, did he go to the apostles and apply for the job? Hey, guys, I'm just sensing, you know, I've been here for a while, and I really like to, I, I, Samaria looks like a good place. I'd like to take the gospel there. I, I don't think he did that, obviously, right? But I will say this, his life was forged before he was the man that God used. Because we know of him, we read of him earlier. Back in the earlier chapters, he's mentioned with Stephen. He's one of the church's first deacons. And because of that, we know that these seven men, Stephen and Philip and some others, were selected because they were men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So they were spiritually men, godly men. And then what we are told is that they were servants because they served tables. They were involved in helping the widows and the distribution there as the church was growing. But Philip, obviously, like any real servant that really wanted to be used of God, though he was doing uh, menial tasks, he was pouring himself into the things of God. And he noted the apostles, these were men that were giving themselves to prayer and to the word of God. He wanted to do that too. And he was pouring himself into the things of God. And he saw their priority and he made their priority his priority. And I believe that Philip was faithful in the little things. And that's why God was able to use him in this big thing. And all I can say is if you're wanting to be used by God, just be faithful in little things. Just be faithful with what God puts in front of you. Just be faithful, that's it. You know, the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Just begin to take those steps of just service to God. God, what do you want to be? I'll be faithful to share Jesus, maybe with a coworker, Jesus in the gas station, Jesus at the grocery store, or, and, and then be a man or a woman of God's word, and you'll be surprised what the next step is. I'm sure there were people surprised that it was Philip. Philip did this whole big revival. I'm sure there are people surprised. Maybe some of the apostles, right? How come God didn't choose some of the apostles to do that? How come some not of the other deacons? Some of the people were probably surprised, but there was one person not surprised it was Philip. That's God. God wasn't surprised. He, he was forging his vessel, Philip, that he could use. And when the time was right, boom. Now, you may think, I do want to be used by God, maybe not in this grand way. I mean, just, just used by God, but Lord, I look at my life and I go, ooh, 
Someone put that in a poem. I thought it was good because I could relate to it. Lord, my love is sometimes cold. My faith is sometimes small. My zeal lacking, doubts appall. My footsteps sometimes falter. I sometimes stray and weakness marks me for its prey. I I can relate to that. So here's what the rest of the poem says. It's a prayer to God. So God of revival, hear my plea, empower and do revive in me. God, I'm not, I I don't want to live this. I want to live for you. So empower me and do me, revive me. Just make that your prayer. God, God, use me. And he will. He wants to do that with all of us. Fuel your walk with Jesus every day in his word. Spend time with him in prayer and just walk in obedience. You'll be amazed what God does. God can use anybody that makes himself available. He did with Philip. He'll do it with you. He had a chosen vessel in Philip. So verse five says he went to Samaria. Now, if you know your Bible and you've been with us through the gospel, you know there is no love lost between Samaritans and Jews. How did this all happen? Well, real quick. I mean, we don't have time to develop it as much as we can, but you have 10 northern, we have 12 tribes, right? 10 of the tribes are to the north, two to the south, that's Judea, and Israel, the 10 tribes to the north. What happens is they fell into idolatry when the kingdom was split. And what happened is the Assyrians, God said, I'm sending the Assyrians. The Assyrians wiped them out. In fact, deported the majority of them. And when Assyria took another country and various other countries, they would put them into the land so that the land, the 10 tribes, became overcome with pagan nations from other places the Assyrians had assimilated and conquered. And over time, some Jews were in the land and other Jews returned. And when they returned to the land, they intermarried with one another and came up with some kind of quasi-conglomeration of worship that consisted of a little bit of Judaism and a lot of pagan practices. And they made Samaria their capital. They are known to us as the Samaritans. And to the Jews who were purebreds, uh, they see the Samaritans as half-breeds. They wanted nothing to do with them. By the way, Jesus has already demonstrated about a year earlier that he's breaking down walls, that the gospel is for anybody because he told his disciples one day, I must go to Samaria. Not we're going to Samaria, I must go to Samaria. He had an appointment there. Remember, an appointment with a woman. We call her the woman at the well. And Jesus meets her and, you know, tells her about herself. Hey, you've had many men. She says, yes, I have. She had had many guys. She'd slept around. And that's why we know she was at the well by herself in the middle of the day because women either come at the evening or the early hours to gather water. She was by herself in the middle of the day. She had been ostracized by all the other women in the village. And she was there, and she was just getting her water supply for the day. And Jesus says, you know, you keep drinking from this bucket of water. You got to keep doing it every day. She goes, I know. I do it every day. But I got water for you that if you drink of it, it'll be a fountain boiling up to living water, everlasting life. And there Jesus revealed to her that he was the Messiah, and she embraced him. And it tells us in that passage In John chapter four, she left her water pot, which is pretty awesome. The whole reason she came was to get water, but she now had living water. She left the water pot, and it tells us she went and told the people in her town about Jesus, and it tells us many Samaritans were saved. By the way, as I think of that story, I'm always reminded, just as we are with Philip here, never underestimate the one life that has changed. One life that has changed, what one life can do. Philip here bringing revival. The woman at the well sharing Jesus with so many others. So Philip now goes to Samaria. By the way, what did he preach? What did did Philip preach? Did he preach self-esteem? Did he preach, I want you all to know how you can know and have a better you. Did he preach, hey, I want you all to teach you how we can all be tolerant, whatever. Whatever you want to believe is cool. Whatever you want to believe, all roads lead to, no. He preached Christ. He preached Jesus Christ. He preached the cross. Thanks for joining us here today on Large Than Life as we go through the book of Acts. There may be no better place in the Bible to learn about what it's like to be a disciple. 
Virtually every verse is a glimpse into the life of these men who had followed and been taught by Jesus personally, but now they are left behind after Jesus' ascension to preach and teach the Word of God. They must continue without the physical support of Jesus there to help. That must have been a humbling experience, but how blessed we are that they rose to that occasion. Have you ever felt like that? You finished college or a certification class, and now without the support and protection of the classroom, you have to go out into the world and apply your new skill. It's a little scary. I imagine it must have been something like that for the disciples, too. Here at Larger Than Life, a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint, we want you to know and experience the incredible, awesome love of God. And on our website, ltlradio.org, you'll find so many ways to learn about Him. You can find a link to download our mobile app at ltlradio.org and subscribe to the Larger Than Life podcast. This will give you access to every single one of Pastor Ron's messages and many other encouraging resources. Once again, that website is ltlradio.org. TLRadio.org. We're at the end of our time today, but we'll be back with more on Larger Than Life.